just as we've had to adapt to the kind of new time and era of college football, I think y'all have had to adapt a little too. This used to be that uh, signing day press conference where we talk about you know all the all the great players that you sign and everybody signs the the greatest class they've ever signed you know year in and year out and and uh, that has changed you know that has changed you know obviously uh, we didn't sign one player today. Uh, which is, I think, indicative of how much college football has evolved and changed um, over the past three years, quite frankly, is when this all began. Um, but there are some definite players to talk about. There's some movement on our staff to talk about and some, some kind of updates and great things. So I'll, I'll try to hit on a few of these things and then, then we'll open it up. But, uh, you know, when you look at our just kind of what's gone on um, from a recruiting standpoint and where we're at and us as we've started winter conditioning. We've got 30 new players on our roster. Um, when you look at, uh, you know, 22 high school players, uh, eight transfers, um, the, the, the bulk of those players are already on campus. They've already started winter conditioning workouts with Coach Becton. They've already started school uh, and been doing those things. Um, and then we've got, uh, we've got a handful of those guys still to come. I think there's oh, 24, 25 guys already here today and another five or six that will be coming uh, in June when, when school wraps up. Um, and so, you know, I know we touched on a lot of the high school kids, and I'm sure we'll have some questions about some of those guys as we go. But most notably, it's a little bit more about some of the transfers that uh, that have come on board uh, since since we've got going. Uh, obviously, Isaiah Bond is here from from Alabama. Um, an electric receiver for us, a uh, guy that we recruited hard out of high school, Buford High School in Georgia, uh, went to Alabama, really had a tremendous year for them this year, great deep ball player, deep threat, elite speed. Uh, we think there's more to his game than just that, and so we're looking forward to working with him. Uh, Amar Nyblak is a, a tremendous uh, pass-receiving tight end um, that, you know, with, with the loss of JT Sanders, how do we fill that void? Um, had a tremendous touchdown against us where I think kind of opened a lot of our eyes to what he was capable of. Um, Tia Savea, uh, defensive lineman from Arizona, um, you know, guy Coach Nansen coached uh, at Arizona, 6'4", 305 pounds. Naturally, again, you, you have the void at the interior defensive line. You get a veteran player to fill that. Um, I think Trey Moore is the next young man, um, a guy who, you know, we've been talking a lot about how do we improve our edge pass rush ability? I think we did a lot of that in the high school ranks. You know, Colin Simmons, Zena, those guys. Uh, but to get a Trey Moore, a guy who 13 and a half sacks last season, uh, conference player of the year, guy who we played against two years ago, uh, when you could really see the physicality and the intent of which he played the game. So love having Trey and his veteran experience. Uh, and then Kendrick Blackshire, you know, coming back home from Duncanville. Um, Big physical inside linebacker, where we just we got a void at that position. Jalen uh, moved on to the NFL. Jet Bush moves on. We had a couple transfers. We signed a great class a year ago of five high school linebackers, but you still want some of that veteran leadership on your defense. And so to to bring him on board was big. Um, and then Silas Bolden is the other one who is still at Oregon State. He's going to end up being a grad transfer. He's going to graduate this semester at Oregon State. And then he'll join us in June, another elite speed receiver for us. Veteran player had a great year last year at Oregon State. So I, I think the one thing I'd like to just hit on that is, you know, it, in the end, the transfer portal, I know there's a lot of, you know, opinions on it. Is it is it a positive? Is it a negative? Um, you know, for us, it's a positive. You know, we, we are never going to major in recruiting the transfer portal in a way that that's going to make up our roster. We still want to recruit the bulk of our class from the high school ranks, highly competitive, high character kids coming from great programs, get them immersed in our culture, develop them uh, in our program year one, year two, year three. But what the portal does for, for a school like us, it can help you fill the voids when the voids um, happen. You know, we, we lost two receivers that declared early for the NFL draft in Xavier Worthy and A.D. Mitchell. We had a few other receivers decide to transfer on their own. All of a sudden, after that Sugar Bowl, 
I looked up and I had three scholarship receivers on our roster, okay? We had three receivers committed out of high school. That left us with six. So we went and signed one more high school kid in Aaron Butler to get us to seven. And then we went and took three, three transfers that got us to the, to the number 10 at the receiver position, which is a more of an ideal number to have on your roster. So that was really helpful and beneficial for us. We talked about the tight end position. We talked about the defensive line position. Um, Andrew Makuba coming on board, you, all of a sudden, yeah, you, you have a couple guys that graduate, but all of a sudden, Jaron Thompson decides to transfer. Keaton Crawford decides to transfer. We have got to fill up our roster, and we can't go into every season and me sitting here in August telling you we're a young football team. right? We, we've got to have some experience. We've got to have some depth there. So I do think the portal uh, has been advantageous to us. Um, now we got to get those guys acclimated to our culture, our team, how we go about our business. Uh, and that's one of the fun parts. That's one of the challenging parts that, that we definitely are looking forward to. You know, uh, one thing we're really proud of here in going into year four, I've had the same same coordinators on our football team for, for now going into four straight seasons, you know, whether it's Pete Kwiatkowski, Kyle Flood, Jeff Banks. And, and that's, that's critical for stability and continuity on your staff. I've had the same strength coach now, Tori Becton, going for four years. So I think that's big for our players. Uh, but naturally, with success comes opportunities for, for other coaches, okay? And, and, and naturally, we're, we're trying to find the best coaches uh, that fit us culturally, but also um, that can develop players that have proven to develop players and that can recruit at a high level. So to bring in Johnny Nansen from Arizona, uh, who was their defensive coordinator at Arizona in, in a heck of a turnaround that they had last season, um, a guy that has worked with me in the past at Washington and USC is, is a huge addition for us. Uh, and then to go identify Kenny Baker uh, from the Miami Dolphins to come and coach the defensive line, uh, a guy that every person I call to, to ask about can't rave enough about um, the quality of coach that he is, the way he can relate to the players and and be, st be demanding but yet still relate to them so that they can continue to grow. And whether you want to call Mike McDaniel, Chris Greer, all of, all of guys that I respect in the profession, uh, couldn't be more excited to have Kenny on board uh, for, for, what he's, for what he, I think, is going to bring to us, not only on the field but also from a recruiting ranks. You know, we made some, we made some kind of adjustments in our recruiting department. Um, like I said, you have to be adaptable in this day and age of, of college football. And uh, I, I think now more than ever, we've got to make sure that, that we've got a strong foundation in place in that department. Uh, so to promote Brandon Harris to general manager, John Michael Jones to director of player personnel, Taylor Searles to director of recruiting, and Kendall Perry to director of recruiting operations, I think keeps the foundation of our recruiting department where it needs to be. Um, and we're probably not going to be done in that department, just so you all know. There's probably going to be a couple more additions uh, to that department. I think now more than ever, because of high school recruiting, the portal recruiting, the relationships we need to have uh, with the families uh, is critical. But couldn't be more excited for, for those four. Uh, and what they've given to the program and their time here and the, the opportunity to reward them, I think, is, is the way I would love to hire. I would love to hire from within. I, I think that that's given people an opportunity for growth in your program, and, and all of them have, have definitely done that. So uh, a couple other just sidebar things before we open it up. Um, I'm just so fired up for what our winter and spring sports are doing right now. Um, I, I just feel like every every chance I get, I can turn on the game and or get to a game and, and watch our people compete, our coaches, uh, our student athletes is just it's just phenomenal. Uh, uh, and I know I sound like a brokered record, um, been saying it for three years, but man, it's inspiring. It's inspiring to watch the competitive spirit uh, that our, that our teams play with. Um, that our coaches coach with, uh, you know, even last night, you know, watching RT and, and our basketball team really struggle in the first half, but the fight that they showed in that second half to to give themselves an opportunity at the end of that game, um, and I, I know they've, they've that's been a heck of a journey they've been on. They the six straight ranked opponents there, uh, which is kind of unprecedented. But the, they, they've they've got they've got work to do, and but but whether it's Vic and just every sport, it, it's been awesome to watch. And then just shout out to Kyle Shanahan. 
man in uh, getting the Niners to the Super Bowl again. He's a dear friend, a guy that uh, I have a ton of respect for in the profession, a guy that I love sharing ideas with, and, and to watch him do his thing is, is awesome to see. And then also Charles Amenahu, who I know was injured for the Super Bowl, but what a huge play he made in that game before he got injured with the sack fumble. So always cool to see Longhorns doing great things. And um, I would just say a couple things on your radar uh, as we as we look ahead. We've got, you know, starting next week, we've got four more weeks of winter conditioning where our coaches will be back and now we'll, we'll fully be immersed with a full coaching staff. Our strength and conditioning staff will be big. Uh, we'll take off a week for spring break, and then we'll come back and start spring practice on March 19th. Okay, and we'll do that for five weeks. Um, we'll practice three days a week. Um, our pro day will be March 20th, that Wednesday. Um, and then our coaches clinic will be that Friday, Saturday. I think that's March 22nd. Okay, and then we'll wrap it all up on April 20th for the spring game, and I believe that's at 1 o'clock, if, if I'm not mistaken on that. So I know some housekeeping stuff there, but uh, we'll, we'll open it up. Um, Steve, going back to um, Brandon's new job, um, why was he the fit for this? And can you explain what a general manager is in college football these days? Sure. Well, I, I think one thing, you know, when, when I came on board, Brandon was, I, I believe, like an offensive analyst. And, you know, you, you're trying to assess the, the current staff. You're trying to assess who we're bringing in. And Brandon and I just kind of hit it off. I don't know if it was the quarterbacks in us. You know, we were kind of speaking the same language. Um, uh, his his perception of players, uh, I thought, was was very impressive for a young guy. His perception of character, I thought, was very impressive for a young guy. Um, you know, his his ability to communicate. I thought was was really incredible, and it was a guy that we've just grown. Our relationship has grown over three years now, um, and so I felt like the time was right for him to assume this role. Uh, I, I think so many times in football, in college football, it used to always be director of player personnel, and that's fair, and that's what John Michael got elevated to that role. When you're really assessing talent, looking at talent, looking at your roster and things of that nature, but a general manager is so much more now. Uh, when, you, when you start talking about transfer portal, you start talking about NIL, you start talking about you know, relationships with players, you start talking about r really managing the roster at a little bit of a higher level. I wanted to make sure that I had somebody in that role that, that I was connected to on, a, on another level. And I think my time with Brandon has allowed me to do that. I think he thinks a lot like me, which is important. Um, as much as you know, I, I, I try to you know, kind of oversee it all. I want to make sure if I can't be in a meeting that, that somebody's thinking and speaking on my behalf that is on the same wave, wavelength as me. And uh, I just couldn't be more excited. I, I think he's a, a rock star in our profession. Um, and he's going, to be, he's going to be in high level roles for a long time. Coach, uh, last season was a culmination of a three year plan that you put together when you came to Texas. Can you share what, how you amended your plan for the next season, the next three seasons, that we could uh, take hold of and get a window into your thinking? Yeah, um, you know, not to, you know, just dive into like the plan of it, but I, I do think there's something that is important that hopefully our players really recognize, okay? I'm a firm believer team success is what ultimately then provokes individual accolades, awards, and honors, okay? So in year one, we go five and seven, and that was a difficult season for everybody, but was needed, right? It was needed. Um, but at the end of that year, that, that, that resulted in zero players getting drafted in the NFL draft, okay? We come back in year two, we make some improvements, we make some adjustments, we go eight and five. We had five players get drafted into the NFL draft. Okay, we continue to try to evolve and, and improve and get the right pieces to the puzzle, um, the culture, all the things that we've talked about. We go 12 and 2, we, we win the conference championship, we make the CFP, and now we're staring at what could be 10 to 12 players drafted into the NFL draft. Some of those 
leaving early to go to the NFL draft to, to get drafted. And so I, I think that that just speaks to our players like, man, if I can really commit to this team and commit to the developmental process, whether it's in the weight room, whether it's in the classroom, whether it's in the community, whether it's with my position coach, and the more that the team has success, the better opportunity I might have, A, to win a championship, B, fulfill my dreams of playing in the NFL, and C, having a life after football with some of the resources and things that we have here at Texas, that's that's the plan that we're on, right? How do we keep putting a team together that gives us the best chance to be successful and then getting all these guys to buy into that team? And every year, each team takes on an identity of its own. I got 30 new players in, in that team meeting room this morning uh, that we're talking about the things that are going to be necessary, where we're at a few weeks in, where we need to be a month from now as we go to spring break. Um, and so that's, that's always the challenge, right? And as I said before, I think teams – a lot of times take on the personality of the head coach of where he's at in 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 his progression with the program and for me it's pretty simple you know and i, I we came here i came here like i said before i, I didn't come here just to be a head coach again. I, I didn't come here to uh, say that I'm the head coach at the University of Texas. Like, I came here to win a championship, and then if I can get one, I want to get two. And I, I, I'm borderline obsessed with it at this point. Um, I know what it tasted like last year. I know how close we were, and I couldn't wait to get back. And, and, and hopefully that's what our team really starts to exude is this obsession with being the best. Because we have a locker room full of young men that are uh, driven, that are focused, that, that want to be the best. They want to be the best students that, that Texas football has ever had. They want to be the best team. They, they're, they're totally going for it. But that's the challenge day in and day out. And so, you know, September is going to come quick enough. We, you know, we, we've got a lot of work to do between now and then uh, to get ourselves in position to start that journey. Uh, but quite frankly, the journey started two weeks ago, right, as we were getting them up at 545 and we're in, we're in DKR and we're, we're starting conditioning, you know, and that's, that's part of being in college and that's part of that process of, of what it looks like. Steve, how big was it to get uh, Quinn back for at least one more year? And at the same time, look, you have Arch behind him. Where does Arch kind of go from here now that Quinn is coming back? From yeah, no, I, I think it was big for Quinn. Um, you know, I, I think pretty easy to see from the naked eye the development that Quinn made from year one to year two. Uh, I don't think that Quinn was, was a finished product yet. Um, and I think there's, there's plenty of room for, for growth and improvement in, in development in his game going into year three. And I think naturally, you, you know, when, when you turn on, um, you know, you get into the college football playoff and, and you look at the team that beat us, that was a six-year senior quarterback, right, that, that played at a really high level in that game. And so um, – I do think his experience, his maturity are all going to be things that he can benefit from. We're going to need his leadership, right? We've got, we've got some new faces on the offensive side of the ball, especially at the skill positions, uh, where his leadership is going to be very important. Um, and assuming the real face of, of Longhorn football, right, for, for a year, where we lost a lot of the faces, right? A lot of the faces, a lot of the names we've been talking about for, for a few years now have moved on. And, and so now, you know, him, him kind of taking those reins and, and, and understanding what that is is going to be big. I think for Arch, is continuing on the path that he's been on. Uh, I, I referenced it last year, kind of middle of the season, about the growth that he really started to take there in the second half of the season, all the way up until the you know, the, the the Sugar Bowl there. So, um, again, my my idea, especially at the quarterback position, I just don't want to hurry up and get a guy on the field. I want to make sure when he gets on the field that he plays great football, and that's a little easier to do as you start to move and you get into year four of your program as opposed to year one and you're just trying to get the best guy out there to give yourself a chance. Uh, but I think Arch has got an extremely bright future. Uh, we're very fortunate to, to, uh, to have him on our roster. He's got great leadership skills, got a great skill set. So um, those two guys are going to be big for us next fall. So the job is not open, right? No, Quinn, Quinn's our starter. Yes, sir. 
Good morning, Steve. Just two-part question on the defensive tackle position. One, just even though it's early in the process, how are guys like Tia Savea and maybe some of the younger freshmen coming along? And the second part of that question, you know, how crucial is it to really develop depth even this early in the process, given it's probably unfair to ask that position to perform as highly as Tavondra and Byron did last year? Yeah. Um, you know, a lot of these, a lot of these new faces on the defensive line have, um, you know, Melvin Hills isn't here yet. Um, in, in, we'll get him here in June. Uh, naturally, having Alex January here now uh, is very beneficial. Having Tia Savea here now, having some of our younger players watch and monitor in their growth as Sadir Mitchell, the Aaron Bryant's of the world. Um, we still have Alfred Collins back. We have Vernon Broughton back. Um, I'm, I'm sure I'm leaving somebody out here. But in the end, that group as a whole, that's the process that we're underway. And it's probably a little early to, to comment on exactly where each guy's at. Um, but I do think that that room's going to be a strength of ours. You know, th those, those two guys were so good a year ago, and we're talking about two potential first-round picks. You know, I mean, how many, how many teams have that? The, we've got some really talented players in the room now, and that's part of building a program and developing a program and not having to throw a guy out there as a true freshman but letting him develop um, as the other guys are playing. But I also think depth is now more than ever in college football uh, paramount. Um, the reason being, with the expanded college football playoff, you're looking at 16, 17 game schedule, right? You're closing in on an NFL schedule. And so to make sure that we have the depth in place at numerous positions, not just the defensive line, and playing some of these guys earlier in games, earlier in their career, uh, something that we, we evolved to last year, we were playing upwards of 30, 32 guys in the first half of games, uh, I think is going to be big for us. Uh, because the last thing we want to have happen is you're in the second round of the playoffs. If, if we're fortunate enough to make it there, a guy gets injured, and now you got to put a kid out there who hadn't played all year. And so we're going to have to adapt to that, and we're going to have to adapt to, to playing more people uh, and, and, and what that looks like and how we develop those rotations in the right way. Hey, Steve, several times last year you said you were, finally you got your culture that you'd been looking for. Uh, but this game never stops, and you lost a lot of leaders. Um, uh, how important is that trickle down to these guys that are back, and uh, especially with the expectations that never change? Yeah, no, I, I think that that's big. You know, I, I think complacency is is like the devil, man. I mean, I, I just I, I cannot afford anybody in our building to feel like we've arrived, right? Because this is a new team, and this team now has to develop their culture. This team has to develop their strengths. This team, I have to identify their weaknesses and, and how we can improve upon those things. We are fortunate, though, to have a Quinn Ewers back, to have a Jake Majors back, to have a Kelvin Banks back, to have a Alfred Collins back, to have a Maurice Blackwell back, to have a Jade Barron back, to have a... Uh, Oh, David Benda back. I mean, we, we've got a lot of players who have been with us now for two and three years that really get our culture, right? I mean, it, it's ingrained in them. Now it's their responsibility to get that ingrained in these 30 new players, right? As much as it's the coaches, man, it's way more impactful when it comes from – you know, the leaders on the team. And so that, that's always the challenge of empowering those guys and then, and then taking responsibility of it and then growing this team into the team that we want to have as quickly as possible. You're right. With the guys at front line on wide receiver this past year, you know, AD was often on the boundary, Whittington slot where they would move around, but often on the field. Now you've got three guys with pretty similar profiles. Do you feel like you can maybe be, I know it's before spring, but do you think you could be more variable with how you deploy receivers? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful of that. You know, again, we, we are going to have to figure this whole thing out. Uh, and that's the fun part as a coach, right? Um, you know, how far, how much growth can, can the three kids coming back you know, how far can they take this, you know, from, from Niblet, DeAndre, and Jonte, and, and, and what are they going to look like? And they, they all three last year, we trained them at all three positions. And so we, we didn't ever want to make them one-dimensional players. So they got trained that way. 
the three transfers coming in are really versatile guys. Um, you know, Matthew Golden's probably a little bit more physical uh, than than Isaiah and Silas, but again, all playmaking ability, all have cut a, a ton of balls. Uh, and then we've got the high school kids coming in that that I think are all unique in their own way. Obviously, you, the 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 size of Wingo and and Parker is probably a little different than the other guys, but. Um, you know the athleticism of Freddie and the speed of Aaron. I mean, I think that that whole group, that room, is going to be really solid. And again, we've just got to find that right group of guys uh, by the time September rolls around. And so, um, you know, Coach Jackson, myself, Coach Milley, you know, that we're the three, you know, kind of primary guys that work with that group of identifying strengths, working on weaknesses. And then, and then field in a unit uh, that that can play at a really high level that I think they're capable of. Coach, uh, I know you haven't been around him that much, you know the new guys in the program, but what's kind of been your first impressions of specifically Andrew Makuba because he's from here and knows some guys in the locker room? Yeah, I mean, I I think you know, especially for for Makuba, you know, you don't you don't be a three year you know frontline starter at a Clemson decide to come back to Texas if you're not serious about coming back to Texas and and being part of our program and what we're doing. I, I think it's helpful that, that he and Jade Barron have a really good relationship and Jade has kind of gotten him up to speed quickly on the things that are important in our program. Um, but man, when you can get a guy with that experience and, and that type of playmaking ability is, is big for us. Uh, but again, I think he's he's serious about his approach. That's probably my biggest uh, observation of him early on is he came here for a reason, you know, and I think he's dialed into to, to what he's working on and, and how he's trying to um, get to the, you know, everybody wants to focus on the result, but I think he's dialed into the process of it knowing the result that he's looking for in the end. Hey, Coach. Um, I wanted to just get your evaluation of the edge uh, position and how do you see the guys like the Trey Moores and Colin Simmons kind of fitting in? And also, are there any guys from an injury perspective who are either limited or not participating in a winter conditioning at this moment? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm hopeful those guys – you know the edge guys contribute in a way to where we can have a lot more impact uh, with our pass rush off the edge. It's really early. I mean, we haven't we haven't done anything football with these guys yet, so it's a little hard to tell. I know what the film looks like, and then how we can kind of get them ingrained into it, and, and how that goes, we'll see. I, I don't I don't think it's fair to comment on our injury stuff right now that we always have stuff coming out of a season, right? Everybody's got things that we're, that we're trying to get cleaned up on. That's why we don't practice until March, March 19th. Okay. So everybody's working in the capacity that they're capable of working at right now. Um, but, but I anticipate us being fully healthy by spring practice. Yeah, Steve, with the makeup of the roster that you've defined and laid out, is there any reason that, you wouldn't have a drop off next year and what would you say your top couple priorities are for the yeah, spring um you know i i think if we do it right I, I think we'll be a pretty good team you know i think that we've got the leadership we've got the skills at the various positions and the depth at the various positions to have a pretty good team um but the process of getting ourselves to that point is is going to be is going to be the most critical of it all because we've got to recreate right and then not only do we need to recreate we need to do it better right um, and so the 2024 version of Texas Longhorns football is going to look a little different than the 2023 version my job like I said is to identify the strengths of this team and then play to the strengths you know who are we what are we best at how do we play to it um, okay where are some areas of weakness that we can turn into a strength and identify those things uh, but naturally you know the, the first thing to me is rapport with with Quinn and Arch with with our skill players you know and then there's you know, I, I feel very comfortable about the runners I mean CJ and and um, 
and Jaden played plenty of football for us. We're aware of that. We know we've got some really good players behind those guys. I think Gunnar Helm and the offensive line, I feel very strong about that unit. But now how finding that rapport with those receivers is going to be big. And then on the flip side, I think an area that, that you know is finding that right combination of players in the back end um, and finding a way to be even more sticky in coverage, especially from the safety position, um, to defend some of these high-flying offenses that you have to defend, uh, especially if you can get into the playoff. You know, they, they, most teams don't get into the playoff on accident. You know, they can score points, and so you got to be able to try to defend those people. And so those are probably the two biggest areas to, to monitor. I was just wondering if you could touch on some of the emotions y'all expressed after the, the loss to Washington, because I know when you get back, all those guys are going to prepare for the NFL draft and some of those things. What were those the message from some of those seniors, juniors and seniors that, that are leaving? Well, I think one thing, you know, my one of my biggest things in the locker room was I understood the disappointment. Um, we were all disappointed, but at the end, we came into this season to be champions, and they were. Um, they were they were Big 12 Conference champions, something that hadn't been done here for a long, long time, uh, and and something every time they come back to DKR, you know they're going to see 2023 up in the stadium, and they're going to know they were part of that team, uh, and they're going to have a ring and and those types of things. And I was very grateful and thankful for them for the what they gave to this program for the two or three years that they that they were part of it with us. Um, and then it was some tough decisions. Some of those guys had some difficult decisions to make to to stay or to go. And some decided to go and some decided to stay, you know, and, and you just try to supply them with the with the best information that you can and guide them as best that you can. And then where they feel like they're making a rational decision and not an emotional one. And I, and I feel like they all they all did that. Um, um, but but in the end, it's nobody likes to lose, right? And nobody likes to lose when it's the last play. <laughs> you know, I mean, everybody wants to win their last game. And uh, we uh, we had an opportunity. We did not play our best game that night, uh, but it was almost good enough. You know, and but it wasn't good enough. And so um, I think everybody took their 24 or 48 hours to to feel a little sorry for themselves, and myself included. And then you get back to it, you know, and, and the competitor in you gets you gets you up off the mat and, and gets you gets your competitive juices and your drive going again of okay, I got I have a responsibility to to these players uh, who are trying to decide what to do. I have a responsibility to um, our staff to to help them through some decisions because just about every coach on our coaching staff got offered a job this offseason. Legitimately. And so managing those guys through that of what's in the best interest for them, their families, uh, the commitment they made to, to us and grateful for those guys for all that they, they've done. But that comes with success, right? When you, when you play well, you're going to have more players thinking about going to the NFL. When you play well, you're going to have other schools or the NFL coming and trying to hire the coaches off your staff. That's a good thing, right? And that those are, those are problems that man, I would have loved to have had in year one. I didn't, I wasn't quite so fortunate in year one, but now to have those problems, man, that's that's those are those are the good problems, and and so you just try to make sure that you're there for them on, on every level that you can be. Going back to the big picture of signing day, from your perspective, what's recruiting going to look like in the future of Tennessee and Virginia? prevail in this lawsuit uh, against the NCAA and the ban on using NIL and recruiting. From your perspective, how do you size up the potential impact? I mean, Texas is one of those programs that was one of the first to have a, a large affiliated collective pop up. Yeah, I don't, it's, I don't know. You know, I, I try not to forecast too, too much because I know how important the now is for, for what we're doing. Um, but I think that's why you see a little bit of kind of the adjustment that we're making even our own recruiting department of what that's going to look like. So I'm not totally naive to where this thing could go. Uh, but I also know, man, I, I don't want to I don't want to be thinking about 25, 26, 27 when I think we got a chance to be a pretty good team in 24. Um, and so. 
you, you just try to, like I've said all along, you just got to have the ability to adapt and to grow with the changing times in real time as they come at you. And, and there's a lot of things moving at us fast right now in college football. And, and I just, honestly, I, I try to be aware of it. Okay, there's a change. How do we adjust? How do we benefit most from it? Uh, and then keep moving forward. Um, but, I, you know, I, I think it's a slippery slope when, when you're talking about building a culture and building a team um, of, of how much you, you pour into that other side of this thing and how much NIL and all that. Um, because the reality of it is, I, like I've said this all along, I want players to want to come to the University of Texas because of all of the right reasons. The history and tradition, the, 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 the campus, Austin, Texas, the power of the degree, uh, the quality of players around them, the, the coaching staff, all those things. If you're not coming for those reasons, you're not going to you're not going to be happy. It's not going to work out for you. And, and, and really, quite frankly, any school you choose for not the right reasons, it never works out. And then you look up a year or two from now and they're the same guys that are in the transfer portal. And so it, it, you, you, we have to be um, mindful of that. And we, we have to really see the signs and listen for what's important to them, um, whether it's the high school recruiting or the transfer recruiting to keep our culture as sacred as we want to keep it, right? We've we've worked so hard to get it to this point, man. I I just I'm, I'm very cautious of 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 relinquishing that, right? Um, just to sign the next best player, because the next best player might not be the next best player for Texas, right? We we have to be mindful of those things as we keep moving forward. Coach, uh, kind of on Jimmy's question, how do you balance your day with the transfer portal, with the recruits, with the NIL? Are we now at a, a situation where it's professional college football for you? And do you think that's one of the reasons Coach Saban is retired because he didn't want to mess, he just wanted to be a ball coach? Man, uh, he was pretty good at balancing a lot of stuff. I'll give Coach Saban that. He was the best. I, I, I don't know. That's a, that's a question for him. I, I, I do think this. You know, I've tried to surround myself with really good people. Um, I think that's why it's so vitally important that we have the continuity from our coordinator standpoint. I've got the utmost, you know, faith and trust in Pete Kwiatkowski, Jeff Banks, Kyle Flood, A.J. Milwee. Like, those guys, hey, if I can't be at, at a meeting that day, I know that meeting is going to get ran the right way and things are going to get accomplished. That's why having the connection with Brandon Harris and that role from the other side, that he's thinking like me, that I know if he's going to a meeting, how that meeting is going to get ran and, and what that's going to look like. And so um, in the end, you know, you, you, you try to balance it and you try to focus on the things that are, that are paramount in the moment uh, and then trust on the other side that things are going to get done uh, at, at still at a really high level. Um, and so... You know, I, I kind of welcome the challenge. I kind of think I'm pretty equipped for this thing uh, and looking forward to it and enjoying it. And uh, I think that we're benefiting from some of the, the change in college football um, because I think we've kind of been built for this thing and been building towards it. Um, Coach, you know, Jade and Jake, you know, they had some difficult decisions to make on whether to leave for the NFL or coming back. Um, how do you kind of guide them through those decisions? What were those conversations like whenever they were uh, discussing with you? Well, all the guys, when they, um, you know, when, they, when they're trying to decide to, to stay or to go, um, we try to look at it from kind of the 10,000-foot view. And we get, all the, we get all the draft grades from the NFL um, from team specific. You know, I'll, I'll present them with seven to ten teams of real write-ups for them and then where they're at, where they're projected, um, where maybe their deficiencies are and can they improve upon those deficiencies. Um, we look at where they're at from a graduation standpoint or a master's standpoint. We look at where they're at in branding themselves in Austin. This is a great city for a life after football and what that looks like. And we look at a potential role on our team next year and what that would look like. And so 
whether it was the guys that decided to go to the NFL or the guys that decided to stay, it was really the same process to, to, to remove some of the emotion and really make a high-level rational decision in, in what would, in the, at least in their eyes, feel like is in their best interest for their future. Yeah, Coach, a, a, a wide number of the 24 class came from out of state, obviously maintaining control in state is a big objective, but can you talk a little bit about Coach uh, Baker and Coach Nansen and the ties that they have, not only to the, the West Coast, but also to the Deep South where you know recruiting is going to become a more prevalent issue there? Yeah, I, I think historically, you know, for me, having a lot of the ties in California um, has been beneficial. You know, the idea that we could go to California last year and get a Brandon Baker um, and continue to build upon that. And the, and the idea that that footprint in California now is moving east um, with some of those schools, you know, moving to the Big Ten and to the ACC, that now pretty much every kid in that state is going to be apt to willing to go out of state and so uh, coach Nance and I have a great history together I know that he that he is a ace recruiter in on the west coast and in California I know we just touched on my time is getting pulled a little you know thinner of, of that I can just get to California so to, to get someone with a strong footprint in California was big for me um, but I also know we're adjusting and we're moving out of the big 12 uh, where majority of the teams are in the state of Texas and we're all here, we're moving east. And we're, we've, we're going to Louisiana, Alabama, Georgia. Uh, that's now becoming a little bit more of our footprint. And so having uh, Tashar Choice and the work that he's been doing in Georgia and Florida, now to add Coach Baker with his ties to, to growing up in Georgia and, and starting his coaching career in Georgia, but also having worked with the, with the Dolphins, Again, we're going to make our hay in recruiting in the state of Texas, and that, that goes without saying. But the idea that we've got a brand now that um, nationally is viewed upon as one of the top teams in the country where you can get a player or two uh, from, from those states that are quality players, um, you know, I think it's worth our while to, to, to dive a little deeper into that. Yeah, Steve, you're, um, you're just touching on recruiting in the state of Texas with, with the addition of Andrew. Uh, your, your numbers as far as local guys being key contributors to this program are, I mean, you're, you know, those, those numbers are climbing. Whenever you're trying to sustain a culture and build a culture, how important is it to have key contributors or how much of a plus is it to have key contributors who, who are also local talent? Well, it's, it's helpful. I mean, I, it's a lot easier for me to recruit locally. I don't have to get on a plane every every day, but uh, I can I can jump on the 35 or something and, and head up to you know Pflugerville or Round Rock or Maynard or Bastrop or wherever. Right? I mean, we, we've got some local players here that have been high high quality players. We've also done a, a real analysis on a lot of quality players from this local area that went and played at other places that have gone on to have great careers and are in the NFL doing really good things too. And okay, well, why didn't they come to Texas and how do we avoid that in the future? And so um, the idea that, that Jade is having success, Makuba's back, Alfred Collins has had a, is having a good career, is looking forward to a great senior year. Ethan Burke's having success from Westlake. So those are just to name a few guys um, that, 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 that's beneficial. We, our backyard has got really good football players in it. There's been a lot, like I said, there's been a lot of other players from our backyard that didn't come to Texas. And would we have recruited them? Would we not have? You know, that, that, you know that's playing Monday morning quarterback, which I'm not going to do in recruiting because I don't like when you guys do it with me on Mondays. But point being, point being, we have to do a really good job in Central Texas. We have to do a really good job in our backyard of maintaining that the, the, the high quality players that are here, you know, that this is one of their top options if, if they're not coming to school here. Hey, Steve, um, obviously you guys brought in a lot of uh, experienced receivers from the portal. What does that mean for uh, the receivers this year that were freshmen? Um, well, I, I think it's this. I, I think that, hey, we're always trying to field the best team we can, we can field. Um, again, every player we recruit onto our roster here, 
we have an expectation that, that they're going to contribute to our team and to our team's success. Um, how far they take it remains to be seen. Uh, but the three guys that are coming back in, in, in uh, Jonte Cook, DeAndre Moore, and Ryan Niblett, are, are v they're all very, very talented young players. Uh, or we wouldn't have recruited them. They, they've got size, they've got speed, they've got ball skills, um, and their future is very bright. And but but to think I was going to go into a season with three scholarship receivers that that would have been malpractice. Okay, so I, I've got to I've got to try to fill our roster up with enough depth at that room, at any position that and in that case that room to where. There's competition, because in, in my opinion, competition brings out the best in all of us, but also having some experience. Um, I think we were returning eight career catches at the receiver room as well. So the idea that I was able to go get three high-level starting receivers from good programs that can come and contribute to make up that room, um, I think is going to be beneficial for, for us in the fall.